Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I'm the Millbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And I also chair the Hoover History Working Group, which had as its uh, special guest at our regular seminar this week, Michael Daumer, who's Assistant Research Professor at Georgetown, where he's also director of the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics. Michael's uh, written six books, uh, including such uh, broad uh, historiographical uh, subjects as what is classical liberal history and creative historical writing. But much of uh, his research has been focused on the problem, uh, the issue of, uh, of, of slavery uh, in uh, the Dutch uh, realm. The colonization of freed African-Americans in Suriname uh, was uh, one of his most recent publications. Uh, the new project that's taking shape focuses on uh, slavery in New York, uh, where of course there was a significant uh, Dutch presence. And the paper he presented to us was entitled The Price of Slaves in New York and New Jersey, 1675 to 1830. Michael, thank you so much uh, for joining us here at Hoover. Uh, this, this was a paper title that caught my eye because it took me back in time to the days when the early cliometricians were battling out the health or ill health of, of slavery in the American South in the period uh, before the uh, Civil War. And much less, of course, was written at that time about slavery in the North, but it existed. Tell us a bit about uh, the state of the field before you arrived on the scene. How did we think about New York slavery before your research? Uh, thanks, Neil, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, the, the studies of slavery in Dutch New York are actually just coming out. There's a number of, I don't say competing, but I say cooperating scholars at the moment who are working on this topic. Andrea Mosterman is one of them. Nicole Maskeel is another, has a book coming out, Jeroen DeWolf. Um, and the interesting thing is, as I say, we're cooperating, not competing, because we all have different skill sets. A literature scholar, somebody who focuses on geography, one focuses on gender, something like that. Um, and so when I approached this topic, I started doing it from a cultural historian's background, looking into language, how many Dutch speakers were there in New York. But I quickly came to realize that some of the like fundamental questions hadn't been answered about demography and economics. First of all, how many slaves are there in New York? How many of them speak Dutch? Nobody had really convincingly showed this. It, you see a lot of books and articles that say a few or some or many and after a while, you want to know precisely how many, you know, how few. Um, and so I've turned towards the skill sets of uh, economists, particularly, but also demographers, to help explain this story. And so for the past four years, I've been digging into and trying to create my own quantitative data sets on slaves in New York, where they spoke Dutch and when, what the prices of these slaves were. Um, and through this, we can find patterns and trends to explain more of the story. And I think once we know these fundamentals or have some sense of them, we can better tell the cultural story of who these people were, you know, why we should sympathize with them, how they resisted slavery. Your uh, paper, the chapter that, that we heard, focuses very much on teasing out the, the price data this is no easy task. Talk a bit about the sources uh, and then some of the methodological problems that you encountered, and then we'll talk about the price trends that you found. Yeah, exactly. So most or all studies of slave prices in American history focus on the South, and they focus on Charleston, New Orleans, um, maybe Richmond, a few major cities where people are able to get a single data set from auction sales or, or probate records, where they have 5,000 pieces of data that they can work with and focus on all the men that were 20 years of age being sold in that auction, something like that, to find 
uh, trends over time. And to talk about efficiency and, and why slavery grew when and where it did. Now, there's not as many slaves in the North and there's not as good of record keeping. Uh, there's no auction records for the New York slave market that I'm aware of. And so I had to build my own data set by going to the archives. Now, a lot of this is digitized. So I spent many hours looking online for sources, but I also went to a dozen archives in New York and found the actual bills of sale of slaves. And so the database that I've created has about 3000 uh, particular slave valuations, which include slave sales, probate court records where they list the price of a slave estimated in, 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 in the death document of the, of the owner and the property, and also things like advertisements in newspapers and other sources. And so we're able to use that data to try to find prices of men and women over time or by different regions in New York and compare them to prices elsewhere. When you look at the, uh, the data that you presented, the, there's a kind of period where the prices seem relatively stable from the 1720s uh, to really the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, but after that, uh, prices fall, and they fall by around 40%, whether you're looking at the New York or uh, the New York data, or I think it's also true in New Jersey, though I may be wrong about that. What's going on there? Why, why, why this decline in price, do you think? Yeah, so that is correct. I do bring in New Jersey because I think it's a common market. A lot of New Jersey is, of course, immediately adjacent to Manhattan. So much of New Jersey is closer to Manhattan than is much of New York. So I think it's one common market. Um, it, it's interesting in New York that prices of slaves are highest in the 1750s and 60s when slavery is expanding. And they decline at the tail end of the 18th century before the emancipation in New York begins. And then of course, drastically in the 19th century as emancipation is going on. Now, um, it is a methodological problem, uh, a problem in economics to figure out the cause and effect. So through the data, we can show what happened or we can estimate what happened to the prices. And then we need to come up with an explanation for why. And there's a number of potential reasons. I think runaway slaves in New York, I think was runaways was very common. I think that affected the price. There's also um, a change of cultural attitude a lot of the English speaking um, New Yorkers become abolitionists or uh, just simply find it easier and better to emancipate their slaves. I think there's also perhaps an economic story here with um, you know, declining returns on the value of slaves and the replacement that indentured servants or immigrant labor can have. Now that's something I need to dig into further uh, to figure out. Um, but this, this is the first study of, the first serious econometric study of slave prices in the North. And so it just hints at some things that we need to do for further research. Uh, one question that I forgot to ask you when you were presenting earlier, were there any Dutch abolitionists? Or can one see a clear cultural divide here? If you look at the records of the New York Manumission Society, it's pretty difficult to find anybody with a Dutch name. There's a few in there because after a while, the manumission society gets quite large. Um, now they could be hiding under English names and their mothers were Dutch. Um, they could be um, Dutchmen that were uh, in New York City for many generations and no longer held slaves. But it does appear to be a cultural difference. The, the Dutch conservative farm uh, uh, owners are the ones that are resisting abolitionism the most. And so I think there is a story in New York that even though Dutch and English slave owning is overlapping in lots of ways, there is a distinct Dutch cultural slaveholding that thinks that this is normal and natural and, and beneficial and profitable for them. And so they wanna maintain it as long as possible. They are the resistance to the abolitionists. And that's a business model uh, that, that's distinctive too, isn't it? You, you talk in the paper about the kind of farming that the Dutch uh, are associated with. And it's, 
it's not a kind of farming that has a great future ahead of it in the 19th century because this is wheat farming in New York. Uh, talk a bit about the, the, the kind of farming, the kind of work the slaves were doing, because again, in our mind's eye, of course, we have southern plantations, uh, but this is a completely different picture. Yeah, I think slave labor in New York is flexible, if it's anything. Um, and I think they're given more, this changes over time, but towards the end of the 18th century, slaves in New York are, giving, are given quite a bit of responsibility. Sometimes they can work on their own to gather firewood or to build a fence or um, to go harvest a field. Oftentimes they're working alongside other slaves and free laborers, even family members that own them. They're all working together in the fields. I mean, this doesn't mean, this isn't to say that they were a big happy family. I mean, they were, they were still being forced into those fields to do the work. Sometimes slaves even were given permission to run errands. And we see this in, a, in store account books where the, the account store owner writes down the name of the slave came to pick something up um, for, for their, their, their master, for their slave owner. Um, so it's, it's a diverse kind of work that slaves are doing in New York. Although I think, especially among the Dutch, it is uh, grain farming, it's wheat farming that provides the profit to keep slave holding going. The great canonic question was, was slavery declining of its own accord of economic uh, causes, uh, or did it have to be abolished and ultimately fought over? Where do you think your study is going to come down on that big question? I can, I can see why you might argue that there are economic forces at work, uh, because grain farming is going to yeah. migrate westwards. An important point you make has to do with the relative ease of running away for slaves in New York compared with the southern counterparts. And I don't know what to make of the, the price data, but it might be telling us an economic story too. So where, where do you think you're going to land? Uh, did, did slavery die of natural causes, economic causes, or did it have to be killed? Yeah, that's a great question. The big old question of Fogel and Ingerman. Yeah. Um, there's, there's economic reasons to believe both stories in New York. I think there's things uh, that are showing that it was becoming more difficult to own slaves there. But I think some of my research, which I, I didn't talk about today, shows that it's, it's, slavery is a choice and it's possible for slavery to exist in New York uh, profitably. And it was even possible for slavery to expand westward from New York. We could have had northern grain farms uh, operated by slaves in western New York, in Indiana. Um, it just so happened that slavery died out politically just before the Erie Canal was being, or as the Erie Canal was being finished, and as that expansion west uh, took place. But certainly some slaves did move west from the Hudson Valley, even into the Midwest and worked um, cutting trees down, clearing land and farming for, for their enslavers. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm not strong on either side of the equation. I think in this, in this case in New York, economic effects combine with the political effects. And I think they're interwoven in such a way that you can't explain the decline of slavery in New York entirely by politics. Um, but economics alone probably wouldn't have done it. You've given us a tremendously rich picture of uh, almost a forgotten or neglected corner of the history of, of slavery in, in North America. And uh, I particularly enjoyed the, the combination of classical economic history with, uh, with cultural history and the evidence that, that you use, some of it fragmentary and, and difficult, is, uh, is actually uh, one of the things that makes the paper so impressive. So I'm certainly looking forward to, to reading the book when uh, it's uh, finished and, and published. And uh, at this point, I'll, I'll simply say congratulations on uh, a job well done and, uh, and good luck with the, the rest of this challenging but very illuminating research. Uh, once again, uh, 
The paper was entitled The Price of Slaves in New York and New Jersey, 1675 to 1830, a marvelously old school economic history title. But uh, don't be fooled. There's a really rich story to be told here about a lost world, uh, a part of the history of New York that's, I think, largely been forgotten and is only now uh, by you and, as you said, uh, cooperating, if not competing authors being uncovered. Uh, Michael Dammer, thank you so much uh, for joining us at the Hoover uh, History Working Group and, and good luck with the rest of your research. Thank you, it was a pleasure to join you guys today.